Welcome in the name of the great I am who continues to call us towards healing and liberation for all. I'm Pastor Wanji, serving here at Eldersgate United Methodist Church and welcome you to our online worship. Thank you for being with us here in worship and if you are visiting with us, please say hello in the comments. All are welcome. Come, let us worship. Good morning, Eldersgate. We are Wanda and Peter and Armida, connecting with you from the church building, Aldersgate United Methodist Church in beautiful Bellevue, Washington. Please join our hearts in our call to worship. Join your voices with Peter as the people. Look, over there, the spark of God's presence calls to us. We must be standing on holy ground. Look, all around, the light of God's love is in each person present. We must be standing on holy ground. Look, deep within, the light of God's creativity and compassion are part of our being. We must be standing on holy ground. God is calling for our curiosity and our attention. In this time of worship, let us recognize the flame of God's presence everywhere. And let us celebrate that we are standing on holy ground. Let us pray. Igniting presence, your spark is here. Your flame burns amidst us. We recognize that we are standing on holy ground for all creation is holy and all who abide in it are called to be awake in awareness and care. Help us to notice the flame of your passion for healing and wholeness everywhere. Help us to turn our heads and be attentive to the lights of your constant compassion around us and among us. Catch our eyes by the flickering of your grace that is in the goodness and mercy of communion and love. And, and help, help us, us always, always to remember, remember that, that you, you are, are with us. us. Amen. Amen.
Good morning, friends. It's Miss Jen, and I'm here for Children's Time. And I am wondering if you have ever played Follow the Leader. I think we should play it right now. I'm going to do a couple of movements, and I want you all to follow along like you're my mirror image. Are you ready? You guys did a great job following my lead. In today's gospel lesson, Jesus talks to the disciples about what it means to be a follower. A follower is someone who does things in a way that someone else, the leader, um, helps to decide. We choose as Christians to follow Jesus. We're not forced to be a Christian. We choose to follow Jesus and we choose this just like so many Christians around the world because Jesus lived a, a life um, whose life and teachings are worth copying because they lead us to God. Following Jesus though isn't always easy. Jesus reminds the disciples that being his followers will sometimes mean making and accepting decisions that are hard and that maybe they don't really want to do. Following Jesus might mean taking care of someone else's needs, but maybe we just want to focus on our own. And it might mean needing to go way out of our comfort zone to do something, but that something might have a really big or positive impact. So will you be my followers one more time? Will you fold your hands and then repeat after me as we pray? Dear God, we are your followers. Not because we have to, but because we choose to. Give us the strength to put aside our own ways and follow your example as we live day to day. Amen. Amen. Thanks, church.
church, I invite you as we prepare for the prayers of the people to take off your shoes and um, feel the ground or carpet or tile under your feet and to notice the warmth or coolness of the ground, to feel the solidness of the foundation under our feet and allow the energy from the earth to reach into our being through our feet. Let us pray. Holy Word, you have caught our attention today. We have noticed your flickering presence in our midst, and we recognize that we abide on holy ground. We bring our compassionate curiosity to you, loving parent. We bring our often reluctant but honestly caring hearts and ask, who are we that you should call us? Open our eyes to the ways of life that is being consumed and requires protection. Encourage us in the promise of new life beyond the pain. We lift our hearts to all who suffer under the oppression of societal systems. We lift our prayers for all who struggle in physical pain and anguish. We lift our voices in solidarity with all who are imprisoned in body, mind, or spirit. And we strive to lift our beings in willingness to say yes to your invitation to help. May the holy ground on which we stand today empower our steps toward the journey of healing in which we have been placed as your people. We pray for your presence with and for Anne, Nancy, Jean, Shirley, Dorothy, Karen, Sam, Joe, Betty, Meredith, Angie, Christina, Linda, Paul, Barbara, Ethel and Don, Melissa's families, Tommy, Young, Sam, Alice, Helen, Chuck, Sharon, Jason and Jessica's wedding, Pam, Pete, Farrell, Ruth, Kara, David and Kathy, Linda and Dietering family and Janelle's uh, upcoming wedding, and all those in our hearts being said silently or being posted on the comments. May the energy of your earth reach into our beings and give us the strength to say yes again and again. May the burning bushes all around us continue to call out for attention and transformation until new life they reflect is fulfilled. Bless us for this journey, we pray. Help us always to embrace the curiosity. Amen. And now let us share in the prayer that Jesus taught us himself. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're back, Peter and Londa, to bring you the good news of Jesus Christ from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 through 28, from the Inclusive Bible. Draw near and hear the word. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to the disciples 
that he must go to Jerusalem to suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and religious scholars, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Rabbi, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get yourself behind me, you Satan. You are trying to make me stumble and fall. You're setting your mind not on the things of God, but of mortals. And then Jesus said to the disciples, If you wish to come after me, you must deny your very selves. Take up the instrument of your own death and begin to follow in my footsteps. If you would save your life, you will lose it. But if you would lose your life for my sake, you will find it. What profit would you show if you gained the whole world but lost yourself? What can you offer in exchange for your very self? The promised one will come in the glory of Abba God, accompanied by the angels and will repay all according to their conduct. The truth is, some of you standing here will not taste death before you see the coming of the promised one's reign. Holy wisdom, holy, holy word, thanks be to God. We begin this week's story with the words, from that time on. From that time on marks a clear shift in the narrative from the scene one of last week where Peter responded to Jesus' question of, who do you say that I am? We remember that Peter responded, you are the Messiah, the firstborn of the living God. Peter was blessed, named Petra from Simon, and affirmed as the bedrock of the evolving community of Jewish Christians and others like the Canaanites, and Peter was given authority. It's interesting that we find ourselves walking with Peter from stepping out of the boat to sinking in the ocean waves to standing like on top of the mountain as one blessed and here today, we are still walking along with Peter who rebukes Jesus when Jesus tells the disciples of both his future death and resurrection. Peter rebukes Jesus saying, never rabbi, interestingly reverting to calling him rabbi here who he proclaimed as Messiah. Peter's response to Jesus teaching about the way of the Messiah was to deny it by saying, this will never happen to you. Can we imagine if the resurrection never happened? We would not be calling ourselves today the people of the resurrection. We listen as Jesus calls out to Peter as being a stumbling block. Remember that later Peter will confess Jesus as the Christ, the cornerstone of the spiritual house built of living stones to the way of Jesus the Messiah, the promised one. This week's reading in Matthew is a difficult one for us because it is embedded with pitfalls on understanding of suffering, of the cross, the way of discipleship, the way of Christ, the Messiah, the promised one. We are way more comfortable with Peter when he is called blessed in last week's reading, but being told in today's reading to deny ourselves, and in the inclusive Bible, the words are, take up the instrument of your own death, is not something that is easy to digest and understand. Wherever Jesus is inviting us to follow is not somewhere we want to find ourselves, standing, in his case, on the cross. Let me be clear, Jesus is not telling us to find ourselves on the cross. Even Jesus does not want to end up on that cross and certainly doesn't think it is the will of God and the only means available to God. What kind of a diabolical God will, 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 will such a sacrifice of God's own through that kind of suffering? So let's be clear, that is not the invitation and we are not called to be martyrs. Let's keep in mind that in Jesus' context of the Roman Empire and imperialism, the cross was the form of capital punishment. Jesus did undergo trial, whether it was just a, pro a just process or not. He went through a rigged system 
of corruption with many participants involved in it, and he was executed. It was not God's will that Jesus be executed, nor is execution the means by which God brings about justice to save us. God is not calling us to accept capital punishment as a means to bring about God's will for healing or justifying of ourselves and our world. The reality is that when we follow the ways of Christ, the Messiah, the promised one, we may encounter persecution and suffering as the powers that be will utilize all that authority available to continue their dominance. Jesus faced the cross because he stood in solidarity with the oppressed in his historical context. And as the cosmic Christ, we, he stood in solidarity with all people in all times and places. We need to remember in today's story, the story is narrated in hindsight. It is written around 80 CE or Common Era and primarily with the Jewish Christians in mind, still waiting for Jesus' second coming and return. They are living in the time of waiting. It seems particularly poignant that we are experiencing so much of the time of waiting in this pandemic as well. The Gospel writer of Matthew has available already the narrative shared in the Gospel of Mark, which was one of their primary sources written earlier. I share that because the words used that Peter rebuked Jesus connects me to the version of the same story of the disciples in the storm and the go in the Gospel of Mark, in which we are told that Jesus rebuked the winds and said to the waves, peace or in some translations as silence, be still. It highlights for us to connect to the humanity of Jesus, maybe experiencing the upheaval and storms and waves caused by Peter's words in today's reading, and possibly Jesus' own struggles with death and resurrection. Peter rebukes Jesus using authority even and right after his own encounter with Jesus as the divine, who he confessed as the firstborn of the living God. It is heartening to see the humanity of Jesus in this moment, where things shift for Jesus and for his disciples. We feel Jesus' possible anxiety as Peter's words are real temptations for Jesus. And Jesus takes his authority to stand up against such temptations, calling out the tempter, Satan, to get behind him. Oh, how Peter himself fell into such temptations, using his recent authority and rebuking Jesus, who he had just confessed as the Messiah, the Christ. Isn't this how it is in life for us? One minute hot, one minute cold, one minute here I am, Lord, and the next minute not I. Remember, Peter will again take out the sword, and Jesus will again rebuke Peter and tell Peter to return the sword to its place. Put away the instrument by which he will die if he lives by it. What instrument does Peter pick up? by which he will live and not die. Peter at this time cannot imagine the way possible as through both death and resurrection. I don't know what swords we carry that we will die by and not live, but I do know sometimes it is bad theology or understandings about God that can lead us away from God. For example, I do not think any of us believes in a God that would want to see the suffering and death of her firstborn. What kind of God would that be? We have no need for a God that uses means of suffering, sacrifices of their children. That is just diabolical. God neither justifies such sufferings in and through Jesus nor through us as followers. God has no need for unnecessary suffering or sacrifice. We are not talking here about natural sacrifices parents make for their children as part of loving the children. 
though some do get into toxic relationships with their children using similar language. We are not talking here about communal service towards mutual flourishing that requires mutuality and understandings of joyful generosity and service, not as sacrifice. We are not talking here about empathy, kindness, compassion towards ourselves and others, and even towards a process of being reconciled with our enemies. I'm saying that bad theology of sacrifice and atonement has done more harm to especially abused people to sacrificially become martyrs in situations of abuse and oppression to which God does not condone. We need to be careful in our understandings about scripture that leads presumptions like the one often made here that it was the will of God for Jesus to die on the cross. It was not the will of God. Jesus was crucified by the cross, the form of capital punishment in his times under the Roman Empire as he continued to stand in solidarity with the oppressed and the dehumanized in his context. He fed the hungry of 5,000, gathered the crowds around him, possibly leading to protests, sedition, creating a revolution against the powers that be. There were others like the Canaanite woman with whom he found solidarity as well. All these were costly acts for Jesus way before it cost him his life. He was aware of the consequences of choosing to resist and refuse to participate in dehumanization of himself, to actively and willfully desist from such participation, and to take up that instrument of his own death, which was to be in solidarity with humanity in a different way than by having the authority or dominance over others. He actualized what living in his full humanness, the glory of God fully alive, to live out fully what it means to be blessed, which included life being taken, blessed, broken, and being given. The promised one reveals to us the mystery that is death and is not the end and the revelation of the resurrection. As part of my sermon preparation, I was prompt to wonder with the question, what if? What if Peter, out of curiosity, after encountering and calling Jesus the Messiah and listening to Jesus talk about his death and resurrection, instead of rebuking Jesus, asked the question, tell us more about this. Tell us more about this. Maybe we are here today with burning hearts asking, promised one, tell us more about this. After all, we have the advantage over Peter. We are recipients of this good news after the resurrection. Like the listeners of the Gospel of Matthew, remembering this story after the lifetime death and resurrection of Jesus. They are waiting waiting for the promised one, and in their case, because they understood Jesus will come again. So tell us more about this. Tell us more about this God. May lead us to ask more questions of curiosity. What are some questions that you may have? I invite you to ask those questions It is part of the nature of our faith and illumines our way as part of our discipleship, as part of how we take up the instrument of our death. Please post some of your questions in the comments and share. I wonder what kind of questions Jesus had for God. Can you imagine? To die and to be raised? How? Why? And Jesus has some questions for us too. What profit would you show if you gained the whole world but lost yourself? Jesus asked, what can you offer in exchange for your very self? And I continued to ask in response to what Jesus said to the disciples, if you wish to come after me, you must deny your very selves, take up the instrument of your own death, and begin to follow in my footsteps. 
What does that mean? I know that for myself, it does not mean that I participate in my own dehumanization as less than fully human because of my race or gender and continue to sacrificially bear the cross. Words that have become oppressive on top of having experienced oppressive behavior. Not all struggle and suffering is sacrificial or beneficial. And so another way to interpret bearing our cross may mean the resistance to participate in such abuse placed on us. Sometimes the church has used those words, bear our cross, from a position of privilege and power and impose the bearing of the cross on people who are experiencing harm from the ways of the dominant group in culture and current context. Church has a long history of asking people to bear their cross, and that bearing of the cross was disproportionately labored. Let us praise God for those who were often throughout different historical contexts burdened by such crosses to bear and did respond to call out for reforms and made changes in church and culture possible. They were disciples who understood discipleship and the nature and mission of the church to use its authority to create kingdom on earth as in heaven. We are recipients of such people, blessed peacemakers, instruments of peace who understood peacemaking as making good trouble. There is much suffering in our world today. We see fires raging in California Our nation divided painfully, Hurricane Laura, COVID-19, BLM with the recent death of Jacob Blake, shooting of Jacob Blake. Uh, He is still recovering with paralysis in his legs. And the shooter killing people at a protest. Do we continue to not face bad theologies that God desires our suffering in any shape or form, or that God thinks some of us are deserving of suffering more than others in any shape or form, or do we wrestle with the truth that there is nothing good in and of itself of suffering? And breaking news, suffering does happen. It is part of life. None of us are exempt from it. And maybe that is part of the difficulty of today's reading in which we are asked to deny ourselves. It feels like an invitation to suffering. What if the invitation is to participate in God's will, God's grace and love that is redeeming of our sufferings, even sufferings that seems too tragic, too evil, to be redeemable in any shape or form? Aren't we curious about that, what that might be about? We certainly can name experiences of that redeeming will of God as recipients of the gift of forgiveness and amazing grace. I don't think I can conceive a God that would redeem our suffering by using God's own in Jesus to be violently put to death That would be like God being on the oppressor side and using the same means as the oppressors. That way is tempting, especially when we have authority and power. Do we believe that God participate in that cycle of power, of dehumanized, becoming the dehumanizer? I can understand how humanity will more often than not reject kill the messenger that bears the good news of God's love and acceptance of us all as blessed. The cross was not Jesus's goal and not our goal as disciples. The cross became the outcome of Jesus's faithfulness in the face of unfaithful people. We are not called to choose unnecessary suffering, but trust in God's love and grace for all which may mean we find ourselves in solidarity with the suffering of the oppressed. And that will mean we will experience both death, suffering, and also resurrection. If we are asking deep questions from our heart with curiosity, asking Jesus, tell us more about this. 
then isn't it possible that the way of Jesus might be revealed to us? And just maybe we might trust God's way of mercy, which is in solidarity with the suffering. I do know from the uh, Moses story um, this week and in today's reading of Matthew that the Holy One will find us. Jesus will be with us on the way in suffering that we may experience for various reasons that we are able to name and understand and or the kind of suffering, the suffering without any rhyme or reason for it and in which we find ourselves in long wrestling. What I do know is that God does not leave us to our own means. In Jesus, the promised one, God is in the midst of our suffering and can receive whatever questions we have around it. Next week, we will share an online Holy Communion again. Please prepare ordinary elements as means of grace for us, bread and juice. As much as I try to get to this sermon under 15 minutes, I like to share this last story in conclusion. One of the relationships that pastors develop over the years in the context of our ministries is relationship with funeral directors. We often find ourselves working with them up close and personal. Before I left my last pastorate, one of the prayers I shared was with the funeral directors as I thought about the months ahead for him and the impact of COVID-19 on him both as an individual and to his work or what I call his ministries. His father had been the funeral director before him and his father's grandfather had been a pastor at one of the churches I served. So his dad, Richard Sr., was called Dick and his name was Richard Jr and he went by Richie. And during my years as their pastor and with both of them as both members and the funeral directors that I worked with, the son Richie and his wife Carol became expectant biological parents after 20 years of not being able to conceive. They were not new to parenting as they had adopted and were raising two girls from China. Needless to say, when this unexpected pregnancy became part of their lives, it was always named their miracle. The baby was carried to full term and tragically was stillborn. The grandfather Dick and dad Richie were the funeral directors. They chose to do so. After the service, I did not expect to see Dick at our Sunday service. He was always a regular in his pew each Sunday, but that Sunday, I did not expect him to attend. So when he walked into the sanctuary and sat in his pew, I was surprised. I can't remember what my sermon was about on that day, but I do remember praying, oh God, please do not let anything I say cause any harm to this person in suffering. I hope I don't say anything that spiritualizes suffering or justifies suffering. I prayed, God be with us. I don't remember what I preached. It happened to be the first Sunday of the month, and so maybe he knew it was Communion Sunday, and maybe he needed and or wanted to be there. I don't know. I do know him being there was a shift for me a moment maybe like what our reading says today. From then on. It was the only service that I cried through the whole communion service because when I looked out, before I even started to bless and break the bread, tears were already streaming down Dick's face. By the time he came up in line to receive the bread and cup, He was crying through his nose, literally. And so was I, and so was many in church that day. I can still feel myself when I was barely able to whisper the words, the body of Christ broken for you, the love of Christ poured out for you. 
That moment was a gift for the church as we witnessed Dick's presence with us as we took Holy Communion together. Somehow, it was different from the funeral service. I don't know how Dick showed up. I don't know if, what or any laments or questions, pain, faith, grace, hope, doubt, rebukes, or peace he was experiencing. I do not know what it means to pick up the instrument of our own death. All I know is that today's story raised up that memory of Dick's experience of suffering, the tragedy of stillbirth, the suffering. I also know that at the funeral service, it was complete silence when we listened to Jesus' words, I am the resurrection and the life. Words Dick would have heard at every Christian funeral service he directed. My experience with Dick happened before my own ordination where I wondered with God, why me? How is it possible? How can I do that? I know I will be consecrating the elements again next Sunday, and Dick has something to do with that. We cannot save our own lives. And those things that threaten to take our lives, like this pandemic, racial injustices, economic depressions, tragedies, emotional pain, still might find us. And Jesus will be here too, to help us and be for us, to be help to one another. Let us continue to ask questions. Questions show up as a gift of God's relentless, relentless will for us, combined with our tears and presence. Suffering is not the will of God for us, and when we encounter suffering, God does not leave us to our own means and is present with us and through one another. We are the church. Praise be to God. Amen.
people of God surrounded by the cloud of witnesses, including Kent, around us. May every step you take into this world be a step toward new life and renewal. Go now in curiosity and peace. Amen.